welcome to the legal talk by sparring.io and Trama TM. Uh, today we have this special blog for a reason because Hack Košice wants to support ideas that uh, sustain, that actually sustain beyond the hackathon. And for that, uh, either way, you will meet some legal challenges. You will either have to found a company or at least uh, protect your intellectual property or other legal things. Now, if you're a techie, just as I am, and uh, studied engineering or something similar, you will often find legal stuff difficult. So we've created this one hour legal talk for you and we recommend that you get a piece of paper and write down everything that you hear here today because it's gonna be super useful, at least we hope so. And the expert who's gonna help us uh, with understanding the legal hurdles of IT entrepreneurship, startups, and uh, projects is going to be Marian Mayo Povražnik from the sparring.io digital, uh, uh, digital uh, legal office, uh, who's also uh, in the tramatm.com uh, intellectual property uh, digital startup. And uh, He's gonna he's gonna have this talk today. Marianne, hello. Hello everyone. So, uh, Maya, you finished at the university. Touch or or do this for separate block. We're going to talk the relations between founders, and then the second half is going to be devoted to intellectual property and trademarks. But let's school uh, our university studies and one of uh, why should you found Sure. But they were a big. Uh start to to work on a bunch of your friends or uh, classmates you don't need a legal entity for that for sure however once uh, you're willing to either uh, issue some invoice or issue an investment or basically any payment uh, should be processed or you should actually uh, uh, try to uh, try to protect your IP for that uh, definitely a right time to set up the entity for so first of all the entity protects your brand your IP uh, collects all the money and also limits your liability, which is very important, especially when dealing with the, the sensitive sensitive industries such as FinTech or MedTech. Okay, so you're saying that it's impossible to mark for intellectual property without having a, 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 a founded company, a private citizen, a person? Yeah, I mean, definitely that's possible, uh, but it's the idea. Uh, usually, you do not you do not uh, set up the company a founding team, and uh, we've seen a lot of lot of disputes arising out of the fact that the trademark or also other IP was protected only under actual other founders uh, did not have uh, access to that. So it's always easier and it's always a good corporate governance uh, to to have everything under one roof, which is uh, the the company. And also, if you register the trademark on your own, uh, then the investors would be very reluctant to invest into your entity since they would not acquire uh, the the IP. Okay, so basically, what we can conclude from a certain point, a corporation is a must. Now, if you get to this decision. Uh, uh, what are them? And we have a broad uh, international uh, uh, so overview of all the possible options. Uh, okay. Now we can, I guess we have a technical hurdle.
what are the differences between two these two forms of uh, corporations Marianne yes okay can I continue yeah yeah I think you can okay lovely thank you um, so first of all, we can talk on the business activities as the natural person, uh, as a so-called, I would say, freelancer, uh, meaning that you would register yourself with the public authority and talk on the, the, the business activities as a natural person. This is usually easier to register, easier to set up, but cheaper to maintain. However, uh, there are some issues there. Uh, one of that is that the Limitation of liability that is usually the you or your own property, and also it's really hard to cooperate on the large scale projects where you need to cooperate with other persons, right? Because you need to basically bundle, etc. Uh, for the larger projects, uh, usually you have to go with the legal entity. With the legal options, American world, it's usually the corporation, usually the C corp, like in Delaware, or in, or in the UK, um, where ability or the LLC uh, or LTD is not really an especially especially for the startups, and there are multiple things for that. Uh, on the other hand, in the continental Europe, uh, there is also a possibility to go for the lobbying. Uh, which is usually not a really good good choice because it's too expensive, too difficult, too corporate and bureaucratic. And for that reason, it's much easier in the continental Europe to set up a limited liability company, which usually uh, supports the, the the startups. And most of the startups are in as a limited liability company. So you're saying that in Europe, there are limited liability companies, whereas in the Sure, of course. So basically, the limited liability company usually it, it really have a shares. It has the ownership interest, um, the percentage of the particular company. Uh, so uh, it's much easier to to set up uh, that there are only a few necessary necessary uh, necessary conditions under the legislation. You don't need to have a supervisory board. You need to have the board of directors, only one executive is sufficient. Whereas in the corporations, it's a broader, broader concept. Are issued and emitted, uh, usually also distributes, um, and also a multiple, multiple corporate bodies are set for, for you to actually perform its activities. Okay, yeah, we understand that's is as it was in the previous in the previous example between uh, sole proprietorship and uh, some form of corporation again the difference between uh, administrative uh, burden versus uh, the legal uh, protections and the guarantees uh, sure. between them. okay I think we've uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, answered all the questions all the points that I had for this. Perhaps just the last one is uh, information that you've just given here uh, applicable to the whole of Europe. If someone is thinking which country you are one for. for um... This is a good question. Um, it's a stump is you should incorporate in the country of your origin, right? Effects you should also assess. So very often with the startups, the teams are dispersed all across the country, and they're kind of difficult, difficult to to determine the country of the origin. So first of all, what you need to assess, and what most of the startups try to assess, is if you are seeking an investment in the U.S., then uh, you should incorporate your C corp C corp company in Delaware, 
uh, no other state than Delaware, actually. Um, however, if you are in search for the investment from, from Europe, uh, then it, uh, you have a wider range of options, stretching from the UK to Estonia to uh, to country of your own origin. Uh, very often, what we see is that the development and delivery teams are based in the Central Eastern Europe, whereas the sales and operations and the holding entity itself is based in the Western countries uh, where the investors also. Okay. So, again, um... I think the answer requires some more nuanced uh, uh, look into it. So make sure that if you have an idea, you discuss it to the right persons, right? That advice uh, never wrong. Uh, moving on, uh, as we have mentioned, except for the very a uh, real, you know, entity, uh, in most cases you will have to found a company, a company with someone else. And in these cases, you have to make sure that you pick the right people, but just right after you pick the right people, you have to make sure that your legal agreements reflect on your uh, inter interpersonal agreements as well. And uh, they actually provide the protection that you've agreed upon. So uh, what is sort of a, a rule of thumbs on uh, shareholder agreements and founder agreements? So first of all, it's important to have it with teams are full of friends and colleagues who worked together or studied together for, for years. And, and uh, sometimes it's not really important for them to because they understand themselves and consider themselves to be friends, which is fine. But when and our experience shows that when the money uh, comes in, either the investment or the traction with the, with the clients, then the potential potential problems can erupt. Therefore, it's really important, even among friends or family or friends, family and fools, to sign uh, such shareholders agreement. Secondly, uh, once uh, being signed, the shareholders agreement has basically two uh, two two elements. First of all, it uh, formalizes the agreement you've made in in person. So basically, the percentage voting rights. Questing, uh, some tag alongs, drag alongs, etc. But also, from our experience, the shareholders agreement is an ideal tool for the stability of the of the founding team. Because, for instance, if you have a vesting there uh, or some dispute resolution mechanism, then if the things go sour in the in the startup, uh, due to this legal framework, you can actually easily overcome uh, such problems. Uh, whereas without such agreements. Uh, some founders can just walk away from the from the problem and from the startup itself, leaving it uh, vulnerable since the potentially uh, potentially fundamental uh, fundamental know how leaves the company alongside the living dream outcome. Yeah. Okay. You've mentioned quite a few uh, terms here. Uh, I recall voting. Uh, I recall voting rights, uh, vesting, uh, tag along, drag along rights. Uh, I guess we should explain them to our viewers. So what are tag along and drag along rights? And then we'll continue on with the rest. Sure. So first of all, it's usually very small, consisting of two, three, four uh, founders. And then it's very easy for you to steer the company because you have the voting power uh, on the general assembly of the company. However, once the investors are coming in in multiple investing rounds, once you issue a employee share pool uh, for your employees, then actually uh, it might be for that in order to provide the founders with sufficient power, uh, there is a drag along. Uh, drag along actually empowers uh, the majority shareholders to force minority shareholders to sell uh, their entity to the potential investor in the event of exit, um, especially once the investor requires 100% of the company. Uh, the tag along, on the other hand, provides a protection uh, to the minority shareholders uh, because once a majority shareholders want to sell the company and exit the company, the tag along right 
enables and entitles the minority shareholder to actually tag themselves to the transaction and force uh, the founders to sell also the minority uh, shares along with their own. So to speak, speak uh, 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 frankly, is it is it fair to say that without a tag along right, a minority share essentially might become worthless? Yes, under some circumstances, shareholder rights are very important to have in any shareholders agreement. If there such shares allocated to your employees should have some value for sure. Okay, so then you mentioned the best thing. And uh, so, so what exactly is best thing? West thing is my favorite tool. Um, the, the distributed the, the, the equity proportionately among the among the founders. For instance, if there are two founders, both of them get 50-50 uh, uh, shares. But then imagine that the second founder decides on Wednesday that he or she leaves the company. Uh, and then what, what then actually, right? Because the 50% of the shares leave with the second founder. And basically not only you cannot steer the company, but also we have 50% of the shares uh, basically lying with the inactive inactive shareholder, which is really basically a red flag for any investor uh, trying to invest into your company. Uh, so therefore, Westing uh, provides you with a period, usually three to four years period, uh, through which you have to earn your equity, right? So you have to work for the company for at least three to four years to be allocated to the particular shares. But of course, there are, afterwards, there are a number of business nuances basically such as cliffs, for instance, that you do not vest your equity proportionately every month from the day one, but you start to vest them after one year with the company, for instance, so that you prove yourself to be a valuable person and member of the team. So, but in, in general, uh, the vesting uh, significantly increases the motivation and loyalty of your team members. Okay, so vesting uh, is a concept uh, mainly applicable to uh, people who come into the company later than the founders or essentially are employees, right? Uh, okay. Not necessarily, not necessarily, uh, because it also it can be also applicable to the founders themselves. Oh, so a founder, even though he's the majority founder, can lose his share if he decides to leave. And actually, this is actually at the very beginning it might not be so, but usually after the investment, the VC funds actually require. And, uh, and impose such vesting on the founders because the investor don't want the founders to leave in the next two, two or three or four years. So such vesting is usually applicable also to the founders themselves. It might be an interesting aside here that how is you know a being with a company legally defined? It is a quite a puzzling thing for me because as a uh, programmer, I know that there is difference in you know. 500 lines of code and 500 lines of code if someone is an inactive worker now how do you quantify that now you know if i if you have 60 percent in a company you can just say all right i work eight hours a day use uh, 2000 lines of codes per day and maybe it's like totally uh useless to the company and you only do it to keep to the 60 percent of your shares which are only valuable because someone else is actually doing some useful work there so is, is this not a problem? It is. It's a very, very good point you made. I mean, usually for that reason, there is a board, a board of directors or supervisory board that is being set that monitors also the performance of the key people. And if they determine that your 500 lines of code is actually not really uh, important uh, to the particular product, uh, then the board may actually agree uh, on on uh, calling you off uh, the CTO position or whatever position you held in the company, and thus the Westing rules also shall apply. So if you would cease to work for the company after one year because the board decides so, uh, then also you would not uh, receive the full package of the equity. Okay. Okay. So then there was the concept of the voting rights, and that's. Uh... That's, that's uh, something that I wanted to touch more upon uh, in greater detail. So uh, voting rights are, are quite tricky. Can you, can you tell us how to set up voting rights and what should we 
uh, be careful about when we're setting up working rights structures? Sure. Um, I mean, there are two basic rules. First of all, the voting rights should be distributed in a way that the management of the company or the founders of the company would be able to steer the company in the first place uh, so that there would not occur a deadlock, which is a situation where basically no uh, party or group of shareholders can actually be able to steer to steer the company. The very, the very easiest and simplest uh, thing uh, or the issue or the problem to do is if there are two founders and both of them allocated themselves with 50% of the voting rights. Now, this means that basically you always need a agreement of both of them. And this is rather tricky, right? Because uh, for certain, certain, uh, because even for the slightest mind, my, the most smallest, the smallest decision made, you need basically the agreement of all. Uh, so for that is always a good thing to have a casting vote. So I would say the CTO would have a prevailing vote over the other sh uh, shareholder, for instance. Also, uh, once the investors keep coming in or you actually decide to uh, create a uh, employee share scheme for your employees and you become diluted or the founders become diluted, uh, they should really think in advance. Actually, uh, the startup, usually the startup uh, goes through two to four investment rounds. Uh, through which the founders are diluted alongside with their voting rights. So they should really think in advance uh, what rights they want to keep in the long run so that they can be able to keep, to keep uh, the company running and steer it into the right direction. Um, so very, 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 very often, uh, one of the good uh, thing is that if you are issuing the employee share pool, such shares as so-called employee shares are not uh, at the voting right is not attached to them uh, so that uh, the founders nor investors would be diluted when it comes to the voting. Okay, so I think we've, uh, uh, we've concluded the first two blocks. The second one was about shareholder agreement. So I think we can wrap it up by saying that it's always important to have agreements, of course, everybody has agreements, but it's also important to have these agreements attached yeah, or, or fixed in some uh, legal fixture. And uh, then the voting rights uh, and, and all the special rights, well, you've heard, it's uh, each and uh, every one of them is uh, quite complex and complicated and you have to make sure that you understand it before you do it, because as we've mentioned, without tag along, I might need to share anything for you. And the same thing goes for the fourth voting rights and so on. Now we're moving to the second block uh, or, the, or, the, or the last two blocks, which will be about intellectual property and trademark. So uh, once we have the company set up, once we have the agreement with our uh, other founders, uh, uh, we have to uh, sort of uh, uh, make sure that the intellectual property, because I would, I would say that, uh, I would safely say that in 99% uh, of the cases, the viewers would or who are watching this are uh, techies, uh, programmers, and they will do something with software or, or let's say hardware, but like uh, the majority of the, of the assets of the company will be intellectual property assets. So what exactly is intellectual property and how should we protect it? Um, so basically there are lawyers uh, distinguish, I would say, uh, around 10 types of the, of the intellectual property. But uh, in general, what's, uh, there is a basically three, three basic uh, types, uh, meaning the copyright, trademark, and patent. Now, the patents are usually are not applicable to the digital business unless uh, working in the uh, health tech industry or with some kind of hardware. Uh, so for the uh, computer code or the digital products, uh, the patents are not uh, not really relevant. What you should know about them is that it's just too difficult uh, and too too expensive uh, to to handle. Now, what's more important is the copyright itself. Uh, a copyright is usually applicable to the, any source code being created. So basically, any libraries, any any designs, any wireframes, user flows, whatever analysis, product specs. Everything counts as a copyright, uh, which is interesting because you don't need to register it in continental Europe, not at all. In US, you can, but it doesn't make much sense. 
uh, and it's basically so without any uh, any funds, uh, it's basically created and protected. The only thing you should always uh, uh, keep in mind is that for the copyright, you need a usually written agreements specifying uh, specifying the product being created, so that it would be attributable to a particular author, and you will see the license licensing the uh, the source code from the author to the company. And secondly, uh, lastly, there are trademarks, uh, which are basically the brands that are being protected. These are in the end of the in the very end of the particular particular brand, usually the visual one. And this needs to be uh, registered with the public authorities. Uh, you can have uh, trademarks being registered in national basis in particular country, but also, uh, for instance, in Europe, you can have a European wide trademark, which is very handy and it's, uh, I would say value for money. Uh, but, but then, uh, we again are having some technical difficulties. Marian, I can't hear you. You have to repeat this last sentence. No, okay. Very, very Marian, you'll, you'll just have to said because I didn't hear the last two sentences. Sure, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so yeah, so basically what I was trying to say is that for the trademarks, you can have a either national registration in the particular uh, country of yours, or you can go for the supranatural national level, for instance, on the EU, EU base where you can uh, register your, uh, your trademark on the European wide level. Uh, usually most of the digital businesses operating uh, within our area go for the European trademark and US trademark. Uh, thus, they can efficiently, uh, efficiently cover most of the relevant markets of theirs. Okay. So just to come back, so we had the three types and one of them was the copyright and we've concluded that basically patents not applicable for any of the uh, digital businesses that we are talking about and trademarks are, are uh, trademarks are for the trademarks and copyrights are basically for computer code. I've had an interesting discussion with your colleague Igor over the lunch and uh, I mentioned to him a story uh, of a uh, author that I uh, had a discussion with a couple of years ago and this author told me that he's always sending his uh, novels when he has a relevant work uh, piece of work done by himself in a series envelope so that he can have a proof that it's done so uh, can we say that it's the same thing with computer code once you commit something then as you've mentioned is it protected by copyright okay uh Again, it's. I think it's the same issue. We we are having a bit of a difficulty now. Uh, sometimes I just can't hear Marian. What he's saying, he seems like stuck for a couple of seconds. Maybe he can hear me, but I can't hear him. Okay, now it should go again. Uh, did uh, Marian Pograzny leave the call? <laughs> he didn't leave the call, but he left the room that he was having the call in, right? I should probably call him. Guys, what do you think? Oh, are you connected over another device? Yes. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit better. OK. Uh, so let's continue, and we'll see. Uh, hopefully, it will be uh, better. OK, it is. So what was the last thing you, you, you've asked? So I told you the story about the author sending the books in sealed envelopes and I asked, so is the copyright the same thing? Is a GitHub commit the same same thing 
uh, for computer code as a sealed envelope is for a manuscript of a novel? Exactly so. I mean, the uploading of your source code or the computer program to the GitHub uh, works pretty well. Um, however, uh, what's really important is to have a contract, uh, written contract uh, among your developers on one hand and on the, uh, on the company uh, on the other, so that the company would always be able to prove that yes, uh, this particular commit uh, to, th to this particular repository belongs to me because it was done under the my auspices and has been paid, adally paid for. Very often, what also helps is if the particular feature or the product at least somehow is uh, described in the contract itself. But of course, we know that when it comes to the engineering, it's impossible to know in advance what exactly will be built. Uh, so for that, the uh, particular link to the repository is uh, sufficient. OK, so uh, moving on, if I have a startup, you said we have to have a contract with the developers. Is there anything else we should know about protection or are there some services online like, you know, I, I think I would be lost, like, you know, all these licenses, like how do, how do you figure all this stuff out? Is, is it really that that uh, necessary to meet a, a lawyer? Is is there an online solution for all of this or how does it work? Sure, it can get very complex, especially with the corporate clients. So if you work with the bank or some other large corporate, then it can be tricky because you can always have a long, long term discussions about the open source libraries and who should go through the open source uh, licenses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but very often, uh, if you're below radar, uh, most of our clients just do a simple uh, IP assignment. Now, there is a difference that under usually under the Anglo-American law or under the Anglo-American legal IP tradition. assignments, I'll, I'll stop you right there because uh, that's something that I think we need to explain, right? Sure. Uh, so the, the license or? IP, IP assignment. I see. So basically, uh, once you commit your source code to the repository, a basically copyright is created uh, for the particular source code, the, the protection. But the problem is that it, it's usually created by the natural person. And from this particular engineer or developer, you need to transfer the IP, the copyright, to the company that is being basically providing the product to the end customers or end clients, either B2B or B2C. And for that, you need, uh, there are a number of types. Either you can use a license agreement or you can do the IP assignment. Uh, with the IP assignment, usually you as a developer lose any and all uh, copyright for the particular uh, source code. You cannot reuse it, you cannot amend it, you cannot transfer it to anybody else. And due to the IP assignment, all your IP is being transferred onto the company you are having an agreement with. Uh, or if you can use the license, the license may be more flexible because with the license, you can agree what conditions of the license uh, should uh, should follow. Either it's exclusive license or non-exclusive license, or whether it's uh, restricted to the particular countries uh, or whether it's restricted to the particular uh, parties, et cetera, et cetera. But in, uh, one way or another, you need a written agreement somehow transferring your copyright to the company you are working as an engineer for. Uh, and this is actually the, one of the first things uh, which are uh, the VC funds and the legal audits uh, that are basically preceding the investment uh, they're looking into. Okay. So, so this was this was a, a small aside with the IP assignment. So, but we, we were having a, a previous question before that, basically how, how to do it in, in practical terms. And you said it's enough to have a IP assignment and then you wanted to continue with the rest. Sure, so basically you just need to have a written agreement. Uh, and uh, in the written agreement, you should specify uh, two things. First of all, you should specify the object. So basically, what kind of source code or what kind of copyright is being transferred. And then you should only specify the, uh, the circumstances of the transfer, like 
whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive or all the rest. So basically, but it always should be a written signed agreement so that you will be able to prove and protect it when necessary. Okay, I think uh, we've talked enough about uh, IP in general, but let's move on to our last block, which is trademarks. And uh, this is not a coincidence since trademarks are your end. Igor Demchak, uh, who was here today as well, it's a, a specialty. Uh, trademarks are, as you've mentioned, a particular class of copyrights. They're a subclass of all the copyrights that are possible. So, so you've already given a, a very brief overview of all the trademarks. Uh, but uh, sort of uh, my, my, my question would be, uh, when should we as developers start losing our time not developing useful code and not uh, looking for customers and not looking for employees and stuff like that. When should we start to actually uh, start looking at our trademarks? When should we start registering or, or initiating any processes in relation to trademarks? That's a very honest question. Uh, first of all, if you are set up, setting up your business, usually, you start for the searching of the name. Now, the name should, of course, be uh, crispy and sexy and everything, catchy. Uh, but also, most of the people un understand that for the good brand, you should have a free domain. So first of all, once you are creating your brand, you are looking on the free domains. And that's a good good thing to do. And usually, the domains are also cheap to, to buy or, or purchase. Uh, what we are in trauma, what we are trying to do is to basically reshape the think about the brand creation, because very often we see a startups using a brand under a particular domain, however, not having a applicable or available uh, trademark uh, out there. Now, when this happens and you have a good, uh, you have a good traction and you would like to actually enter markets and scale globally, this can be become a huge, huge pain point because you might be forced to actually either go to the IP dispute or trademark dispute or rebrand of your whole business. So it's really important when creating your brand to think about the available trademarks. You don't need to register them at the, that time, but at least you should be aware that, some, that whether it's applicable and whether it's available to you. Uh, once having a good traction and you would like to really enter a multiple uh, markets, then you should really register the trademark, which is not a huge cost, especially with this, some of the services out there. Uh, it's not a, really a huge hustle nor cost uh, for the for the functioning business. Okay, so moving on, like with so so you've already verified that a trademark is available. Uh, by the way, that's an interesting question. How do you verify that trademark is available? A domain, I know how to do that. I go to namecheap.com and I see whether the domain is free, but a trademark, is there like a namecheap.com for trademarks? Uh, and then the follow-up question to that is, what will happen once I do tell you as my lawyer, please register the trademark? Is the lookup of the, of the availability part of the service? Mm -hmm. So there are basically two things. Uh, first of all, you need to see whether the trademark is available uh, for you. That's the first one. Secondly, you need to also assess whether it's, we call it, it's trademarkable. Uh, because very often there are some legal rules applicable. You cannot, uh, for instance, uh, trademark the vulgar uh, word or very descriptive word. So your brand has to be special in, in a way. And there are some legal uh, rules applicable for that. So this is also something you should assess along with your lawyer. The availability itself uh, can be easily accessible in the number of number of services. Now, for instance, we, what we do in Trauma is that we try to connect both. So not only availability, but also the the legal, the legal assessment. Once you uh, determine that, okay, and decide that, okay, I would like to have a trademark, uh, then uh, basically either you can do it on your own uh, and there are relevant public authorities and offices in your country, on the European wide level or in the US, uh, which uh, where you can file your application to. Uh, from our experience, approximately 50% of the applications is correct. The 50% not really. Um, and uh, if you're not successful or you don't want to straight yeah. away or, or... Pardon? does an incorrect application mean a fail straight away 
and the yeah, loss it, of the fee or whatever is there no it's just it's just a loss of cash and time uh, and for that you can also send another another application uh, therefore uh, what we try to do we try to save as much time and uh, funds possible to the potential uh, to the founders and basically be successful at the first time so that not only they will apply for the trademark that is available but also this is a trademarkable because this is interesting thing that not every word is trademarkable for every particular stuff right so if you are a juice producer uh it's hard for you to trademark the best juice as a trademark uh you have to have something very different that is not connected and descriptable to the particular uh performance of yours yeah, I can actually tell you a good example about that. So Hack Košice, when we wanted to trademark this trademark with you, you rejected it. And uh, what was the reason for rejecting Hack Košice? I mean, it sounds pretty cool, right? So why would you? It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, however, since it's related to the software development and hacking, uh, this is uh, considered to be a descriptive uh, trademark. And now if you would be able to be successful, then you would have a unfair advantage in relation to the uh, other other uh, projects out there, uh, and for that reason, uh, the trademark should be more, I would say, specific uh, and not really descriptive. So it's all about unfair advantage in the in the competitive market. Yeah. Well, the very in the very easy terms, the way Igor, your colleague, explained it to me, that Adam, it's all right to to you know. Uh, do hack Koshitsa, but then anyone could do, uh, I, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say hot dog Koshitsa and then sell, uh, sell really hot dogs in Koshitsa because it's, it's the same concept. So that's when we understood it. But if I understand correctly, since we've been using this trademark for many years and we have these very smart partners, partners such as Trauma, you will be able to persuade the public authorities in the coming months that hack Koshitsa indeed has become a term in, in and of itself and not just a descriptive word and therefore we will be able to trademark it and uh, own it. If, as you, exactly as you said, if you have a history, you are already recognized by the customers and consumers and you, you would not enjoy the unfair advantage because you earn it, then of course uh, a defense case can be made uh, for the public particular authority and it can be pushed through but this is always a tough and uh, it's always hard to guarantee so uh, moving on from from our legal hurdles and our uh, little uh, problems uh, once as we've already discussed the process is uh, filed how long does it take and what should we expect uh, this is this is the surprising this is a surprising thing like uh, with the, with the, with the copyright it's basically immediate since there is no registration once created it's protected at least by the author with the trademarks it works differently it takes basically months if not if not sometimes even uh, up to what well, up to one year uh, the whole process the issue is that first of all once you apply a uh, submit the application it's being reviewed by the public authority but then uh, there is always a opposition period for at least three months, depending on the country, where all other people and subjects and uh, companies out there can actually oppose to the registration of your trademark. And then at least, and very often we see that the oppositions are actually really made, and then you need to discuss, negotiate and settle with the opposers so that your uh, trademark will be duly uh, registered without any opposition. So that's an interesting point. Like, uh, if I file, let's let's pick, pick a name. I don't know, like uh, a golden or whatever, like like the best or golden eatery in Košice. Now, who would oppose? Maybe there's someone who had an idea, but he still has not founded the company and said, and can can he just oppose? Or who's the you know the typical case? Who's the typical opposer? And in, in let's say the Slovakian. Yeah. Company. So if you if you if you uh, decide to to trademark the golden eatery in Košice as a Slovak trademark in Slovakia, uh, for instance, a uh, silver eatery from Bratislava may say, okay, guys, but we are also eatery and we are also uh, basically operating in the market of Slovakia and we may be 
uh, and if your trademark would be actually admitted, uh, then you would gain a unfair advantage and the consumers may be misled on the digital uh, website uh, to your website because it's trademark uh, compared to ours. Uh, so uh, such company uh, might actually uh, file a complaint, for instance, and this is an interesting point. Very often it's value for money to try to register the trademark on the European level. So with one application to have covered all European member states. However, uh, this means that basically companies from each and every member state can try to oppose. Whereas if you choose a national state such as Slovakia, the potential pool of the opposers, as you can imagine, is significantly smaller. Uh, so this is something you should also consider when deciding on the registration of the trademark. Uh, wait, you said it's better value for money if you do a European trademark? It, it doesn't sound like that to me. You just said that it's a larger pool. Isn't it better just to do the Slovakian one and therefore, you know, I, I spare myself of the hurdle of having a Spanish golden eatery? And, <laughs> you know, exactly so. exactly so. Once you operate in Slovakia, it makes sense for you to stay here. Usually, however, the digital business that our customers usually are, uh, they scale globally. And for that reason, they want to cover as many countries as possible. And the rule of thumb is that once you want to have a trademark, a be trademarked in more than two countries, the European trademark is better uh, way because it's much uh, cheaper and faster. Because to basically file 20 trademarks in the European Union or 25 or whatever countries you would look, like to cover, it basically can be significantly, the price and the timing can be significantly higher than to file only one European wide trademark. But of course, the downside, as you've mentioned and rightly pointed out, is that you may face a significantly higher opposition. And for this reason, you have to be really prudent when choosing the right name, especially in the face of a creation of, a, of your brand. Okay, so we, I think we know quite a bit about trademarks now i i'm really in the mood to get one uh so uh, how how exactly i do it what's the best way i suppose you're uh you are you're not in a biased position here to answer but uh yeah so what's the best way to register it and how much does it cost sure uh, so as i've said i have to do a conflict of interest uh, uh but precisely for the for the legal hurdles uh, the cli our clients face, we created a uh, trauma trauma tool, trauma TM, uh, through which you can uh, basically file a, with a few simple steps. You can file your application, and the rest is done on backend by lawyers or automation. Uh, but of course, you can always try uh, to file it on your own with a particular website on the particular uh, public public office. Now the pricing uh, ranges from I would say th around yeah. Uh, there are always like legal costs and the costs of the particular fee of the office. Uh, but usually the trademarks range from 300 euros or 250 in Slovakia, or 1,300 euros in the union, 700 in the US, etc. So basically it's, uh, in the hundreds of euros is the cost of the trademark in basically any part of the, of the Western, uh, Western world. So, so, so 300 in Slovakia, 1,500 in Europe, 700 in US. How much is it in Germany and big states like this? Just, just some, for example, if someone has German name, it, it might make sense to only do it in the German speaking countries, right? Is, is like Germany because it's a larger state, a bigger price or is it? Usually, usually the price goes up once you move west. Uh, however, uh, it's again only a, a couple of hundreds of euros, like six to 700, I would say. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I think we've uh, already touched upon all the topics that I want uh, to have answered in this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and we are uh, now 55, uh, 51 minutes. Uh, before we do a wrap up, uh, we will uh, perhaps touch upon the other legal services as well that you do, uh, not in trauma, you have a, a, different, of, uh, a, a different legal office as well, uh, where you provide different services. This is a full service. Now, 
this is a general legal workshop, so we don't want to, you know, <laughs> uh, be doing a promotion for your office. But just in general, uh, what would you recommend as uh, a top five steps of a starting startup to do uh, when uh, it uh, tries to enter the, uh, the market? So definitely uh, the first step is to set up a company so that the founders would be protected against any, any liabilities. Uh, and also it's a good, good uh, go governance step uh, when you are seeking uh, for an investment and cooperating with the other clients, especially when you are doing the B2B business. Uh, then it's important to have a founders relations, uh, relations covered. So basically signing the shareholders agreement with your founders and your employees is important because it uh, stabilizes the team and also prevents many other disputes to, to come. Uh, it's important to actually issue a usually employee share scheme so that your employees are transferred basically to your parent, uh, partners since they have a skin in the game. It's important to protect your trademark uh, via uh, licensing agreements so that you would have all the uh, IP under under one roof um, and also it's important to basically try to be proactive when uh, when dealing with the legal issues because lawyers are not wizards and if uh, as we say when she hits the fan uh, we cannot cure everything and it's important to try to prevent any 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 uh, any drawbacks you might you might face in your business. Uh, be stronger with your agreements and avoid any fees or penalties you might uh, face in the future. So consult consult uh, as much as possible when not certain of your of your steps, and you will avoid a lot of problems in the future. Okay, and uh, how much should startups spend on lawyers? Depends. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, our portfolio companies usually usually spend uh, hundreds of euros per month uh, for the subscription services of basically access to the templates, customized drafting, and some consulting. Uh, but of course, once the startup grow or they actually find themselves in the real troubles, uh, then for instance, in the US, one hour of a lawyer can be and can start from one thousand dollars. So then it can be really nasty. Okay, so so the answer was hundreds of euros per month. Well, I mean, that's a pretty general question, but uh, what, what can we do, right? Uh, okay, uh, guys, we have five minutes left. Is uh, I've heard that if we should finish five minutes. All the viewers who watch this and will be watching this later, thanks a lot for your attention. I've had a discussion with Marian Rajmatian.com, a graduate of Oxford University and a lawyer here in Slovakia. Uh, thanks a lot, Marian, for taking part. Uh, we have also another announcement, as you've mentioned. Trademarks are cool. Trademarks with trauma are even cooler. Uh, the only uncool part about the trademarks with trauma is that you actually have to pay for them. Like it's 300 euros, it sucks, uh, except you don't uh, because we have a special offer for you. Uh, we are launching a new initiative called the Hackosh 2020 Startup Track. Now, the point is we want to support those of you whose hacks will sustain beyond the hackathon and uh, therefore we want to give you a quick start in this world of uh, uh, legal hurdles and troubles. So for those Slovakian startups that actually within two weeks after the hackathon show that have a public facing website, number one, and number two, have a project that is buildable, demoable, uh, whatever else, uh, will get a free, that means not 300, but zero euro uh, uh, trademark registration service from Trauma TM. Uh, thanks a lot. So guys, uh, we'd like to invite all of you to uh, join this challenge. We'll be uh, contacting those who are eligible because this is obviously a Slovakian only thing. Uh, after the judging, we hope uh, that we'll see a lot of successful demos. So we have a large selection pool. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, Marianne. And uh, Thank you very much. let's go back uh, to the rest of the program. Thanks a lot, guys.